This section of notes, we're going to be looking at physical geography, climate, and vegetation of South Asia. Some of the key concepts to kind of pay attention to is the reason the Himalayas are located where they are, um, and that India was actually a subcontinent. And then let's look at the climate zones, uh, not only what determines climate, but how monsoons actually affect the climate. Hope you enjoy. Physical geography. South Asia is known as a subcontinent a large, distinct landmass that is joined to a continent. It is separated from the rest of Asia by mountains, specifically the Himalayas. And then you've got the Hindu Kush on this side. It is known as a subcontinent because it used to be part of Africa before it broke away, because it used to be a separate land, hence the section of this notes, separate land. Then we look at the land of great variety. One thing I want to point out to you is that Nepal and Bhutan are the only nations in South, Af South Asia, sorry about that, which are landlocked. They do not have any oceans or seas or access to the water. Number one that I want to look at under land of great variety is the Himalaya, or as Brad Pitt would say in the movie Seven Years in Tibet, the Himalayas. According to continental drift, about 60 million years ago, the Indian subcontinent was part of Africa. It broke away from Africa and collided with the Asian continent. These tectonic forces formed the Himalaya. This movement of these tectonic plates smashing into the Asian plate formed the Himalaya mountain ranges. Mount Everest is the world's tallest peak at 29,035 feet above sea level, and it actually grows 2 centimeters per year. Pretty crazy. Then we look at other landforms. Some other landforms, which you will see in this region, are the Karakoram Mountains. You can see that range in the top corner. You also have the Khyber Pass, which is this kind of semi-flat land zone in between the Karakoram, the Himalaya, and the Hindu Kush. It's an area where migration has came through because you don't have to go over the mountain range. Uh, and you also have the Ganges Plain. One-tenth of the world's population lives in the Ganges Plain area because it's flat and because it's relatively fertile. We also have some southern landforms that I want to look at. Um, there's two mountains which have been eroded down, and that is the Western Ghats and the Eastern Ghats. You also, between these two, you have the Deccan Plateau. This plateau is part of the land mats, which used to be part of the African continent, which broke away millions of years ago. We also have an island in the bottom corner of Sri Lanka, kind of teardrop-shaped island. It broke away from the ori original Indian landmass a long, long time ago. And then the Maldives. It kind of looks like it's pronounced the Maldives. It's the Maldives. It's a chain of islands, about 35,000 square miles in total land area. Major river systems of South Asia. One is the Indus and the Brahmaputra River. Brahmaputra, I've kind of pointed out there. And then the Indus River you could see here. The Indus flows mainly through Pakistan. This area was home to the Indus River Valley, which was known as the Cradle of Ancient Indian Civilization. The Brahmaputra River in the northeast flows east through the Himalaya and then west into India and Bangladesh. It joins the Ganges River to form a delta before emptying into the Bay of Bengal. And you can see that delta there. Then the Ganges River, kind of point it out to you here. The Ganges River flows east from the Himalaya. It's the most important river in South Asia. It's fed by the snow-capped peaks of the Himalaya Mountains. Uh, it remains the same size throughout the years. During the summer monsoon months, it does flood. There's devastating floods around the area. 
The land area it flows through, like we talked about earlier, is the Ganges Plain region. Uh, this is the most agriculturally productive area in South Asia. Uh, it is the world's longest alluvial plain, which is an area of fertile soil deposited by flood rivers. And also from these rivers, you have silt deposits that build up from the floods, and that creates kind of low-lying areas as these silt deposits are washed out. Um, and then this, these low-lying areas, the, these flatter areas, are susceptible to flooding, especially during the monsoon months. So uh, the low-lying areas are, are heavily flooded during the summer monsoon months. That noise means it's quiz o'clock time. Your first question, define what an alluvial plain is and then identify what the alluvial plain does when there's a lot of rain. Natural resources of South Asia. Number one, water. Water resource management challenges cross national borders. In other words, there's water problems, mainly the pollution of water, and this, these water problems cross different borders. There's not just like one country's problem. They all share this problem. India funded the Chuka Hydel hydroelectric project in the country of Bhutan. And in return for funding this project, they get some of the hydroelectric power that is produced there. Dams ensure consistent levels of water for irrigation because a lot of times these rivers are actually flooding and then sometimes they're being drained and there's not enough water. But dams control this. Actual energy resources. There's quite a bit of petroleum resources um, in this area. You can kind of see them pointed out here on, in these maps, um, especially in the offshore areas. Uh, there's some petroleum deposits that are located, and you've also got some um, natural gas deposits in this area, uh, which you could see pointed out. Other than that, you've got a lot of coal um, and some other mineral resources, which you could see on that map. Timber is a very important industry. To preserve the fragile Himalayan environment, the government of Nepal is implementing conservation plans to conserve the amount of timber. You can see the forest located in the southern areas of Nepal. Bhutan has that as well. But they're trying to conserve the amount of timber available for now as well as for the future, and that's a, a key idea for sustainable development. They're trying to use the resources in a way where they'll still be provided in the future. Moving on to climate and vegetation, South, Africa, South Asia, I'll get it right eventually, South Asia's climates. The first we're going to look at are the tropical and subtropical climate zones, uh, and that's the ones that you'll see are located kind of in your dark pink and your light pink colors. Tropical rainforest climates with a variety of vegetation are located along the western coast of India. You can see that here. Also near the Ganges Delta area in Bangladesh, and also the southern tip of Sri Lanka. You can kind of see those locations. Proximity to the Indian Ocean and the equator creates these types of climates. Very important for you to recognize that. Proximity to the Indian Ocean and the equator creates these types of climates. A tropical savanna climate surrounds the central Indian steppe and is also found in Sri Lanka. A band of humid subtropical extends across Nepal, Bhutan, and Bangladesh in northeastern parts of India. Then moving on to the highland climate zones, which are located because of their elevation. These are your coldest regions, and they're located in the north. Little vegetation can survive in parts of these climate zones because it's so high. Grasslands and bamboo surround the Himalayan footlands, but your highland zones are located there in those mountain ranges. And then last but not least, your dry climate zones. The Great Indian Desert lies to the east of the Indus. Surrounding the desert, except on the coast, is a steppe. And you can see that location where they are here in the orange and the dark orange and even right here in the middle uh, around that desert. 
that we were talking about. Now your natural uh, vegetation. I want to look at monsoons first, and I've got this map pulled up for a reason. Most of South Asia experiences three distinct seasons. Hot, which is in late February to June. Wet, which is located from June to July to September. And cold or cool from October to February. These periods depend on seasonal winds that blow from the north and northeast. In the hot season, warm temperatures heat the air, which rises and uh, changes, which and rises and triggers a change in wind direction. Moist ocean air then moves in from the south and southwest, bringing winds. So, in your summer months, which is your hot months, you're going to have uh, wind, which is coming over the water, and it's going to be wet. This wet wind is going to mean a lot of rain for the area, which is going to cause a lot of this tropical forest zone that we're going to see here. But then, in the winter months, this air is going to come from the northwest across the colder regions, and they are going to be dry, which is going to create uh, winter monsoons, which are actually dry and very cold because they're coming from this area. Yet another quiz o'clock time. What I need you to do now is to contrast winter monsoons with summer monsoons in South Asia. Make sure you point out which one receives rain and point out which wind direction or which direction the wind is coming from in each one.